come to the seventh week of the course in machine learning. This week we will have two separate themes. The first lecture will be on tools and resources, and the second lecture will be on interdisciplinary inspiration for the field of machine learning. So we will start with this lecture and talk about a number of tools and resources that can be used for the implementation of machine learning systems. This week has a number of sub-themes and I will shortly go through them with you now. So the first theme is about industrial contributions to the area. And uh, roughly one can say that from the late 1950s to 2010, machine learning was more or less a research area in artificial intelligence. And the bulk of results came from the research groups. There was a modest industrial instance over time, uh, but um, what happened in 2010 was more like, like, like an explosion of interest. And because this change of interest was so dramatical, uh, I, I want to talk uh, specifically uh, about this and uh, how the various companies are engaged from that point onwards. Having said that, we will start with, I would say, with a natural and simple corner. Machine learning is about algorithms. I hope you have understood that during this six week we have been together. Uh, algorithm working on representations. And essentially, uh, this is the classical scenario in computer science. One talk about algorithms and data structures. And the next step is implementation. And implementation typically happens through programming in a programming language. That's the classic scenario. So it's very natural to start this discussion with, with the scenario where you want to build a machine learning and you more or less program uh, your system from scratch in a particular programming language. The next theme uh, is about the excess of data and uh, also about some general resources for computing. So if you want to do any kind of serious machine learning, you need a good supply and a large supply of the kind of data you, want, uh, you need to work. And you also need uh, reasonable resources for computation uh, for, for the execution of your algorithms. And um, happily enough, um, not since long, but slightly longer uh, than this explosive interest in machine learning, uh, most of the big software companies have put a lot of effort in developing uh, software support uh, for what is now typically called cloud computing. So there are a lot of tools, uh, support systems around for both getting services from the so-called cloud for having help uh, for development and for also doing computations. So, uh, so it's appropriate also to bring that in the picture here pretty early. Uh, the next step, uh, sub-theme number four, uh, is about what I called here software development enablers. That could be libraries, it could be tools of different kinds, it could be APIs, etc., etc. Uh, so I will discuss that, and I will go through a number of examples of such software tools existing uh, at the moment. Um, the fifth thing is about a category of systems called technical computing systems. 
where Mathematica is, is such a system. And of course, it's also clearly possible to implement a machine learning system uh, in terms of such tools. Uh, the sixth theme is about uh, enhanced hardware support. More powerful uh, computers, architectures, uh, more powerful processors dedicated to this kind of tasks. And the final theme for this week is about data sets and repositories for data sets, because that's also a crucial com component if you want to do applied and serious work in, in this field. Let's start with a short discussion about the industrial interest in the area. So let's talk about companies with substantial research and development with this focus. Uh, as I said, traditionally development of techniques in this area has been driven by research groups at universities and research institutes, with a few exceptions. Companies like I IBM actually uh, have been very interested uh, on, a, on a moderate level for a very long time. Uh, so uh, there may be a few other such examples, but not many. In the 1990s, there was an increased interest in machine learning. Uh, so the uh, area of data mining was formed, and data mining was uh, primarily uh, very applied and driven by, by, by industry. However, the magnitude and the size of work in data mining at that time was, I would say, on the normal level, uh, considering that machine learning already then was a serious uh, technical area. However, what has happened since 2010 is something different. It's a clear trend shift and it's an explosion of interest in this area. Uh, and not so many years have gone since uh, that, that time. Uh, so what happened is that suddenly almost all influential software companies, but also more and more hardware-oriented companies, have made large investments in, in building up competence in artificial intelligence and machine learning. Also officially stating their belief that this competence with subsequent effects on their products and services will be pivotal for the further successes and competitiveness of these companies. So uh, not only making this uh, silently in the background, but rather very clearly and officially stating uh, this is as, as a way, for, a, a main way forward. Uh, also, apart from large companies, one can, uh, one can have observed uh, during the same period, an extensive set of successful startups coming up, some of them grown to be independent companies, but also many of them doing, in a moderate size, doing profitable exits uh, when acquired by, by the competing industrial giants who want to really uh, expand their territory. Um, so, why did this happen? So, um, it's not easy to tell, but you can at least you can mention one can mention a few uh, contributing factors. So, just before this happened, we could see some really clear success stories uh, for this field, specifically uh, uh, related to improvements. Uh, of performance in image processing and in speech processing. Uh, obviously, also, uh, we, we could see uh, an awareness of the possibility of, of, of optimizing performance, because performance 
have been a, a, a huge problem historically for this area, specifically uh, for the field of neural networks. So, so, so essentially, one could also say that neural networks have benefited most as, an, as a sub-area uh, due to, to, the, to the extended uh, presence uh, and availability of, of better hardware support. Uh, also, there are some areas that has been uh, been growing and been developing uh, during this period, uh, and is still developing. And where the prognosis are also very good for further expansion, and that are those areas are robotics and autonomous vehicles. Uh, also, uh, we in a broader uh, sense we can see the, the, the upcoming presence of cyber physical systems where we more and more uh, tie together uh, digital systems, cyber systems with physical systems. And, and very close to that, the concept of Internet of Things. So because we got very much more of these interwoven systems both of hardware and syst uh, software, uh, the, the impact of AI and machine learning algorithms are scaled up. We could have one algorithm that existed for 30 years, but 30 years ago, uh, the overall technological presence in various sectors of society was not so big. So therefore the effect of applying this algorithm was smaller. Today, the, the impact has grown. Um, so just to sum up, the industrial interest, of course, had a big effect. Uh, it has had an effect on research and development, but it particularly also have a, a very strong effect on the availability of tools and resources. Because if you want to uh, have extensive uh, development of this kind of system in industry, industry needs tools and resources, and a lot of resources have to be put into uh, that development. Let us now look at some of these companies that has been uh, engaged uh, in this area since roughly 2012. And up the top, you have Google. So uh, Google uh, has worked very hard to establish themselves as a key player on this arena. So even since 2010, they have a deep learning AI research team called Google Brain. They also recently, in 2017, announced a whole, a whole new division of, of the company dedicated solely to artificial intelligence. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, the Alphabet holding company, for Google has also uh, bought and taking over smaller companies. Uh, one example of an important company being taken over is the DeepMind technology uh, company, uh, also focused in 2010, that have shown immense success in various kind of game playing applications. So this is Google. Uh, another company has also been very early on this, but a little later than Google, uh, is Amazon. Uh, so initially the focus was very much on the improvements of Alexa, the Amazon AI uh, language assistant, which they also worked hard to integrate into their, their Echo speaker series uh, system. Uh, but uh, uh, soon they also looked uh, more and more onto their, what they call the cloud platform of Amazon, the Amazon Web Services, and put a lot of efforts of, of, of augmenting uh, that platform with uh, machine learning uh, components. Uh, so um, Amazon have a lot of power, uh, obviously, 
and uh, even if they started a little later, they are now a, a really important player in this game. Uh, IBM has been very active since the 1950s, so they are an exception. They've been uh, active for a long time, and they are still uh, active. Uh, and um, they created a pretty famous system called IBM Watson, was originally more of a question answering systems um, of problem sol solving type. But what they have done now is also more and more, more created uh, software tools uh, that various kinds of user can access sub functionalities of the original Watson system. And they also seem to that these kind of functionalities are available into also the IBM cloud, um, uh, cloud services. Um, we should not forget Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft also had a well-known and, and very much used cloud service called Azure. Um, and um, also here, Microsoft have worked hard to introduce uh, machine learning uh, components. And of course, also Microsoft has been interested in having their own digital assistant in this way called Cortana. And Microsoft also tried to strengthen their, their position here uh, also by purchasing a, a lot of smaller AI companies, five companies only in, in 2018. Um, Facebook is, is also uh, engaged. They have an IR research group called FAIR, and I recently recruited top people uh, from, from specifically from neural network like Jan Lekun, uh, which you heard about in earlier about in earlier lectures. Uh, they also uh, developed and support competitive software packages. Uh, to, for example, Google. Also, uh, a European actor, SAP, uh, uh, are, are engaged. Uh, they, they also have a cloud platform, uh, which they, in the same fashion, developed in the, the machine learning uh, direction. Um, finally, Apple. Um, has been very late, obviously, in, in this. But as it seems, uh, they try also now to get into this, uh, this game. Uh, there are also hardware companies that, that are important, um, but I will take them up uh, later in the lecture. Let's start with a scenario where you want to develop a machine learning system yourself from scratch in general programming language, the classical scenario. So which programming language should you choose? Two languages that have been used a lot in artificial intelligence for a long time are Lisp and Prolog, typical representatives for the functional style of programming and the logical program style, uh, style of programming. However, if we look at the situation today, uh, for industrial machine learning applications, these languages have not a strong role. Actually, for real life machine learning systems, we can observe the dominance of languages that support the object oriented paradigm. During the last 25 years, I would say, the triad of languages C, augmented with C, to become oriented, Java, and finally Python have dominated the C. However, over this period, changing their relative top position, as indicated on this slide, where you can see that originally C, C++ was very dominating. Uh, over time, uh, Java became more dominant 
And finally, at this moment, the most popular and most widely used general programming languages is Python. Yeah. Uh, or, and um, there may be many reasons for that. I mean, Python is a really good language, so of course that can explain the whole thing. It's a very clear and simple and straightforward language. Uh, but also, uh, it's the fact that Python is a language that uh, easily uh, lend itself to programming in many paradigms. Uh, so um, probably for machine learning, uh, the, the future lies in multi-paradigm languages uh, because very much of the history, because very much of the history, as I already told, was lying in, in functional programming, in logic programming. So of course, it's very nice if you have a language that could be efficient, like C, uh, but not only imperative, also object-oriented, functional, uh, uh, logic-oriented. So this is some kind of explanation where things are moving. There are also other uh, uh, general languages uh, that are coming up. Uh, one such language is the R language, uh, where there is a very strong specialization in the language towards statistical computing. One can also say that for certain applications where efficiency uh, and, and real-time issues are still very important, uh, this uh, combination of C and C++ still holds a strong position. So let's now go and look at uh, through a list of this kind of languages. So as you see here, uh, currently Python uh, is, a top, uh, is at the top. Most of these languages are open source. This means that you can access this language. You may have a license, but it would not cost you anything. And many times the restriction what you can do or cannot do uh, is pretty uh, liberal. Uh, second place at the moment um, still comes Java. Uh, and uh, third place, as already said, C++. 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 Also, in, in, the, in a kind of, if you look at a, like a top five group for popularity, this language R is included. Then there are a variety of other languages uh, that are on, uh, on in this ballpark. So you have uh, languages JavaScript, uh, which is also popular. You have languages Scala, used in some contexts. Uh, you have other special languages like Julia uh, coming up. Um, but as you see at the bottom here, uh, Prolog and Lisp are still there, but not very much used in practice. As I already said, machine learning is not only about algorithms. Very essential aspects are the access to relevant data and the access to necessary computational resources. So as a consequence, a natural basis for machine learning systems are the systems for distributed cloud computing provided by, at, at this moment, all major software-related companies. And uh, the common term here are cloud, cloud, uh, cloud systems, cloud platforms. And essentially, what you can get out from the cloud is as an as a end user, you can get services. So this means that uh, you can, can this on a distance, you can acquire services. You don't have to worry about how, how these uh, services are, are realized. Uh, so you only have an end user experience. So this is what people in this field abbreviated SSAS, Software as a Service. 
Um, the next step, uh, which is not so much for end users, but for developers, that, that people talk about PaaS, which are platform as a service. So, so not only specific services are provided, but uh, uh, platforms for, for development of, of new applications are, are provided via the cloud system. And finally, uh, you have what is called uh, abbreviated IAAS, which is that you can also uh, get access to more or less infinite infrastructures, uh, computational and data storage resources via, via uh, the cloud system. Uh, so <clears throat> I think the trouble of taking this up here, this is not machine learning, this is distributed computing, this is cloud computing. However, uh, it's a very, very clear tendency, and I, I already touched it a number of times in this lecture, uh, that almost all of, of these uh, cloud platforms are now at the last few years and presently augmented by components uh, that supports machine building development of machine learning systems. So, Looking at the various uh, frequently used cloud computing platforms, <clears throat> the same old players occur. Uh, I guess everybody has heard about the iCloud, uh, but also Microsoft <coughs> has a very ambitious uh, cloud computing system called Azure, uh, Amazon Web Services, uh, in a similar way, and SAP Leonardo. <coughs> so all these big software companies uh, uh, have their own solutions here. But there are also, as you can see below, um, some more clearly open source uh, oriented, even if some of the others also now are open source, even if they are, are developed and, and, and promoted by the big companies, uh, there are also these kind of solutions that originally also come from a purely open source environment. Uh, and an example of that is our system related to the, uh, the foundation, Apache, which is an open source software foundation. Um, but also today, there are new alliances formed, actually. So, for example, uh, this Hadoop system uh, often uh, occurs in the context of, of collaborations with IBM. Uh, uh, so, so this is an arena. And uh, yeah, in a, in a minute, you, you, you will see also more couplings uh, coming up to, to the extensions to machine learning. Just recently, I, I started with um, talking about developing machine learning systems from scratch in a programming, general programming language. Actually, this is today not a typical thing. It's not only for machine learning, for, for any kind of software development. The typical thing is not to develop any code from scratch. Typically, what you do is you combine existing, atom, uh, uh, I would say, atom or molecules of software code uh, uh, from libraries that already are, are programmed and tested and developed to perform some functionalities. So the task of programming today is rather combining uh, pre-existing modules. Of course, you have to program somewhat, typically. I think it's rare that you can only, only build something from these pieces and, and, and put them together. Uh, the typical thing is that some program is still needed, but a bulk of the work and a bulk of the system functionality comes from the combined functionality of the atomic block blocks. Uh, and uh, today, therefore, there is a whole range of what I, I call here software development enablers. 
uh, of, of various kinds, uh, named uh, with a lot of different names. What is pretty straightforward, though, to start with something is software library. So software library uh, set of, uh, consists uh, of subroutines for important algorithm function for, target, uh, for a targeted application there. And it could be narrow, it could be broad. So this is always important and it's been for a long time and it's still there. Uh, but today there are also other, other tools. So people talk about integrated development environments, IDEs, which is, are tools that not only uh, provide access to a library with a subroutine, but also with uh, some, some com software components that automate some useful processes of the development, uh, such as debugging, code generation, uh, et, et cetera. Uh, and then on, on a slightly larger scale, people talk about software development kits, where we essentially can combine uh, a number of these IIDs to, uh, together. Uh, and uh, even larger than people talk about framework. Um, and then you also have this important concept of application programming interface, API, where an API uh, as, as should be because of the name, part of the name interface is rather an interface to these tools and to these libraries. So an API, one could say is a logical representation of what is in all these toolboxes that you want to access. Um, it's not a priority here of this lecture to classify these, all these enablers um, um, uh, that, that exist in an area for machine learning uh, according to these categories. Because the borderlines many times are blurred. There may be many reasons why people call something what they saw that. Um, so it's not really meaningful to, to, to try to achieve very sharp bound, boundaries here, especially not in, 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 a, in a state, uh, the state we are in, where, where we have a very intensive development uh, going on in, in these areas. Uh, unfortunately, one can say that because of all these concepts and because of that so many things are developed and so many things are interrelated, it's, it's not entirely trivial uh, to, to understand the, this uh, fast growing forest, uh, uh, to use an analogy uh, of software uh, tools. But I will mention a few. So in the, in the next few slides, I will mention a few of the enablers that are relevant uh, if you want to build machine learning systems. Let's look at a few of these software development enablers. Um, and there are various kinds. So you can see on the top of the list, you can see a system called Anaconda, which is basically a distribution channel or a platform for distributing Python and R programming language in, in, a, in, a, in a convenient way uh, for, for the users and also uh, handling the program libraries uh, that uh, comes with, with these uh, languages in an efficient way. <clears throat> then, then there is a category of, of support system that, that is strongly focused on support for building artificial neural networks. So I would say <clears throat> not only one can say that many of these tools uh, are support tools for doing uh, efficient multi-array calculations. Because as you have understood from earlier lectures, 
it doesn't matter where you start from. If you have a vector machine or an artificial neural network, uh, many times you can transform uh, uh, those systems uh, onto uh, computational problem expressed on uh, multi multi-dimensional arrays. So anyway, TensorFlow is such a system. It, it's one of the primary tools that is pushed uh, uh, by Google. Uh, uh, probably is one of the most popular uh, tools at, at the moment. Uh, there is a competitor to TensorFlow called PyTorch, uh, which is sponsored by, by Facebook. Um, and uh, <clears throat> both these, both both these are open source. So even though they they have a very very strong company coupling, uh, they are they are uh, easily available. And both languages are very very clearly coupled to programming in Python primarily, not only but primarily. Uh, then. Um, we have a similar Microsoft uh, system called Cognitive Toolkit, uh, which have, have a mixed Python C uh, connections. Um, then um, you have other systems. I mean, one issue here is, is that, that many of these systems are interlinked, which May is probably a good idea because it's useful, but when you when you start to understand what's going on, it's a problem because uh, a system like Keras, it's a system of its own, uh, but it is a system that could run on top of some of the others like TensorFlow, uh, Microsoft Cognitive Toolkit, and and so on. Okay, so 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 these are the systems. There are similar systems. Amazon has also uh, a, a toolkit of this kind, and as I already said, even IBM now tries to more and more uh, offer at least a lot of sub functionality to the original Watson system uh, in various contexts uh, for 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 their customers. So um, here you find more, more, more of the system. I, I like to focus mostly here on uh, on the top two on, on this slide uh, because um, this system uh, not only should need to provide efficient access to uh, all the range. Or machine learning algorithms. Uh, many times it's very important when, when you run a machine learning systems project uh, to be able to uh, coordinate a number of resources and a number of steps. And one such support system is this Jupyter notebook, which is essentially, which emanates from a similar project developed uh, product uh, in this project called IPython. Wow. So, so they these two go a little together. Uh, essentially, what this this kind of support system try to do is to help you to coordinate work, maybe in different languages, because you don't necessarily have to just work in one languages, but in a variety of toolboxes, and also to coordinate your data, and also to help you to present the results uh, uh, in 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 a, an efficient uh, way. So this is like a, a very popular complementary support system in the machine learning context, as this very mean. So the rest of the systems here are more um, just more of the same. Uh, I mean, for good or for bad, there are many, many powerful actors here. 
who, who want to have their market shares and all the actors develop their own systems. In a way, competition is healthy because it's, it's, it sharpens and push the functionalities. But it's also, I would say, somewhat confusing uh, because it's not so that there is one tool that is best for that, another tool for that. Uh, there are just a, a, a bunch of tools for each of these actors. And uh, some are more popular, some are less popular. And this develops over over time. So my, simply my, my advice uh, actually here is that very much uh, what you choose is depending on the context you are in. I mean, if you are an independent person, uh, if you are a student and you have no uh, special connection, you, you, I think everybody has a connection, even if you're a student, you, you, you have a context. You have your university, and it may be so that your university or your department or the research group you, you, you work together with, they have made some choices. So they decide if they want to work in this environment and not in that. So, and if you want to make something useful, uh, it's always uh, clever to utilize the, the, the competence of the, comp of the context you are in. Uh, and, and even more, if you come to a company, uh, it's very, very clear that most companies made, made some choices here. So this means that, that uh, the actual choice you probably have as a person uh, in this kind of setting is rather limited because uh, people have made a number of choices uh, for, for you. I also want to introduce you a little to, to another realm of support system, what, what is called here technical computing systems. Uh, and uh, so technical computing system uh, is the application of the mathematical computational principle of scientific computing to solve practical problems of industrial interest. So it is not scientific computing, it's technical computing. Uh, so, uh, this kind of system are dedicated software system for support of this kind uh, of computing. Uh, so typically they comprise implementations of a great variety of key algorithms in applied mathematics and uh, some extensions of that, but also some general program capabilities. So, so even these systems uh, have some kind of programming languages are built in. Uh, for doing uh, this extra uh, tailoring needed to glue uh, the pieces together. Uh, increasingly so now, technical computing systems comprise implementations directly, explicitly of key machine learning algorithms. Uh, I, I would say some time ago, you, you could use this kind of system for, for implementing machine learning algorithms, but there were no pre-implemented such algorithms. You had to do it yourself in terms of the mathematical tools, applied mathematical tools. But today, there are more and more of, of these classical machine learning algorithms built in. Uh, so, so essentially, there are three categories of systems. So, so for a long time, there have been a numerical analysis software system that really supports uh, uh, numerical analysis um, pro problem solving. But there also a category of system that started to be developed in, in the 60s called symbol manipulation systems, where you uh, essentially solve uh, mathematical problems symbolically not numerically. Uh, I would say today, the most widely used systems are, are not extreme in any of these sense. The, the systems used today, uh, at least for, for, for machine learning, are hybrid systems. Uh, in this genre, it's more common that the systems are proprietary than, than, than open source in the sense that you have to pay, not just little, but probably reasonable sum uh, 
to use this system. And there are a lot of restrictions also then, of course, of, of the Jews. I'd like to say a few words uh, about uh, some of the most widespread technical computing systems. I, I believe one of the most well-known and popular are math still Mathematica, but it's a proprietary system. It, it's provided by an organization called Wolfram Research, uh, and uh, it's based on its own general programming language called the Wolfram uh, language. So this is very much, the, I mean, it's a good system, but it's a closed system. Uh, maybe as, as a reaction to that, uh, uh, at least some open source alternative have been developed. So an example of that is the system at the bottom called SageMath, which is open source. And that system was released in 2005. Otherwise, the, the uh, competitors in the original shiner of systems uh, to Mathematica, uh, I would say primarily are Maple and MATLAB. So MATLAB, in contrast to Mathematica, is primarily, uh, primarily a numerical uh, computing uh, system. In contrast to Mathematica, who is a, so so it's a balanced hi hybrid, um, and one can say on the other side of the camp, you have a system like Maxima, who, who are really developed from from uh, from the symbolic side, the computer algebra uh, uh, systems. Uh, one general comment here uh, that uh, I made also earlier is that uh, for this kind of genre you are probably very much constrained in your choice by by the environment you are in typically a university decide uh, typically a company decide whether you, you you want to use one of these systems either you are uh, an organization that uses mathematica or you use maple or you, you use matlab uh, you don't typically use all these systems in, in some kind of mixture. So depending on where you are now at the university and or later at the company, you will probably then, uh, the choice you have is to use uh, what the company already decided for you. So the next theme uh, is about hardware. So one very important factor in the success, recent successes of machine learning is the better hardware support. So uh, what is mentioned a lot today is the existence of what called AI chips or AI accelerators. And um, machine learning algorithms, particularly the artificial neural network ones, demands more computational power than what can be provided by conventional CPUs. So new computing architectures are, are, are needed. Uh, and uh, these terms are used, AI chips, AI accelerators, or neural network processes, because um, uh, a lot of the efforts recently have been on efficient computation for neural networks. Uh, not only, but, but primarily. So what I mentioned here, on this slide are, are kind of four, four, four trends, four streams of work. So there is something called heterogeneous computing, uh, which, which has been going on for a long time, uh, where you actually design complex uh, compu uh, computer architectures uh, where you uh, combine various kinds of specialized processors with, with conventional ones, and you even embed them on the same chip. So, so this is a kind of multi-core, uh, tailor tailored processor structures. It is, has been one way uh, of achieving uh, better performance. What is talked about mostly, uh, actually, and you probably have heard about that, are the, is the use of, of graphics processing units, GPUs. 
Uh, and essentially, the story is that that these these processing units were developed b because in the gaming industry, primarily where you had a lot of visualization, a lot of graphics, you needed uh, very very high performance. So so this kind of, of architectures was developed in that field. However, it turns out that, and hopefully you, you, you have got a feeling for that, is that mathematics behind this are pretty similar when we talk about neural networks and image manipulation. So therefore, it wasn't a big step to uh, realize that uh, it would be a good idea to, to use, or uh, not only just to use, but, but to adapt uh, these kind of professors for the machine learning uh, tasks. So, so GPUs is still probably the, the main trend in development here. Uh, but there are also other avenues. Uh, there's something called field programmable gate arrays, uh, which is another architecture philosophy for processors. And um, something called application-specific integrated uh, circuits. So one can say that the GPUs uh, have triggered the process and they are still dominating, but computer architecture is a broad field and there are many, many ways forward and uh, not everything happens on the graphic processing tracks. Uh, also the other streams uh, mentioned here, I mentioned here. Uh, where our work going on. Uh, this leads uh, to uh, the hardware companies and their own. So what one can see is that hardware companies that traditionally wasn't really interested in artificial intelligence and machine learning, suddenly when when they realized that this technical sector could be a really good avenue for, for, for increased and strengthening uh, of, of their customer base. Uh, they also, uh, to some extent, also engaged themselves, not only in the hardware part, but also in the, the, soft, the software aspects. So, uh, so you can see that companies like NVIDIA, who is the, the, the key player on the GPU side, uh, companies like Intel, Qualcomm, etc., they, they also lift their eyes to, uh, more to, to the software uh, aspects. Uh, also, one can see the, 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 the opposite way is that companies uh, who, who Traditionally, what wasn't so specialized on uh, uh, focused on specialized hardware, uh, Apple, Samsung, Google, Microsoft uh, have started to interest themselves in these specialized uh, processing architect processor architectures, because of course for the reason that they do not want to be entirely in the hands of the other cat uh, category of, of, of companies. So, so there is a jungle of, of systems coming up here. So, so they're all, um, I mean, of course, NVIDIA is very well known and, and they uh, all, all, all the time uh, come up with new, more efficient uh, versions or, or models. But also, uh, you can see on the list here, Google themselves, uh, uh, produce uh, processing units. Um, so obviously now this has become a field where the software and hardware companies be. So, so there is another aspect which is important here for, for, for this meeting between hardware and software. It's because uh, when this development started, it was very tricky to use this special kind of processor. So this means when you build the system, uh, um, uh, you have to kind of tailor your solution and uh, your system uh, for the explicit use of the GPUs. 
uh, which was very tricky. So, so there is uh, actually a category of, of programming language and tools uh, developed now. You can call them GPU languages, but you can also call them GPGPU, which means general programming based on GPUs. Uh, and there are a few of those who are well known. I think the most well known are is called CUDA. Uh, and CUDA is very much coupled to N NVIDIA. But there are also others coming up, OpenCL, Arlen, and, and so on. And it turns out, of course, that if you, you, if you have a tandem development of very good specialized uh, processor systems, and also that you are the, the driving force and, and you are monitoring the development uh, of, a, of a popular language of this kind, you have a competitive advantage because uh, your language, uh, as quotation mark, in a way is always slightly biased to the kind, type of professors you, you, you push for. So therefore, we can also see now uh, that, that uh, all the hardware companies have understood this and also engaged themselves, therefore, in this kind of languages where you have a strong support for uh, getting help on how to utilize the specialized uh, processes in your system for the for the for the um, purposes you you want. So these were uh, the repositories where, where you can assume that uh, the data sets are are have a, a more guaranteed level of of, of quality. Uh, however, there are now a lot of, of other open data sets. So, so they are not closed, you, you can go to them, but of course there is no guarantee that for every uh, data set in these repositories, uh, it, 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 it's, it's, um, it's a trivial task to just use the data. Normally in many cases you have to have some pre-processing of the data from these data sets. So on this last slide, you can see some more examples. You can see some example that many of, of the big software company, companies like Amazon, Google, um, Twitter, etc. Uh, they they collect data and they also uh, exhibit this data in a, in a, in, a, in an open fashion. But there are also large organizations like U.S. government, World Bank, etc who also uh, uh, make data sets available in an open fashion. So this was the end of this lecture. Thanks for your attention. So uh, the next lecture, 7.2, uh, for this and the last one for this week will be on interdisciplinary inspiration sources for machine learning. Thank you. <laughs>